Today, as you heard from Tikhon, is the uh, Friday of Bright Week, uh, on which we celebrate the Feast of the Life Receiving Spring, the Zoavochos uh, The feast takes its name from a shrine uh, built over a spring of water dedicated to the Mother of God that was founded on the outskirts of Constantinople in the fifth century. Uh, to the present day, the shrine and its spring are the source of healing miracles. It's therefore fitting that the Papist Patristic Institute has invited Professor Mary Cunningham to give a pu public lecture this evening called, Who is Mary, the Mother of God Seen Through Byzantine Eyes? Mary, the Mother of Jesus, has a place in the religious consciousness of two and a half billion Christians who constitute the largest religious group in the world. Muslims, who constitute the world's second largest uh, religious tradition and who also revere the Mother of God, Mary, bring that number uh, up to four and a half billion, which is more than half the global population. It's striking to think that a woman who lived in Palestine 2,000 years ago has a place in the, as I said, religious consciousness of, uh, of more than half of the global uh, population. Of course, Christians and Muslims understand Mary differently, and Christians themselves often disagree on Mary's role in salvation and her place in the life of the church. This evening, Professor Mary Cunningham will help us answer the question, who was Mary? In responding to this question, she will explore a wide range of sources and traditions, the writings of the Church Fathers, the hymnology of the feasts of the Mother of God, patristic and Byzantine sermons, apocryphal writings, the theology of the ecumenical councils, and depictions of the Mother of God in Orthodox iconography. In terms of her background, uh, Professor Cunningham did her undergraduate work at Harvard University and holds a PhD in Eastern Orthodox Church History from the University of Birmingham in the UK. The majority of her teaching has been done at the Universities of Birmingham and Nottingham. She is currently an Honorary Associate Professor of Historical Theology at the University of Nottingham, where her primary focus is research and writing. She is the founder of the Orthodox Theological Research Forum, which, uh, where she organized 10 annual conferences between 2003 and 2013. And anyone who has tried to organize even one conference will tell you what a remarkable achievement uh, that is. Uh, she has also been a research fellow at the Institute of Archaeology and Antiquity at the University of Birmingham. In that capacity, she directed a major research project on the Virgin Mary in Byzantium, investigating liturgical texts written in honor of the Theotokos, Especially, especially festal sermons and hymns, which is one, one of her areas of expertise. The research project produced a large body of important publications to which I shall return in a moment. The author of numerous books, articles, and translations, Professor Cunningham has worked on authors and topics ranging from the hymns and homilies of St. Andrew of Crete, the life of Michael the Singelos, the theology of icons, and the 15th century memoirs of Sylvester Siropoulos. For those of you who might not know, Siropoulos was one of the delegates, or at least in the entourage, that was present at the Council of Florence in the 15th century and wrote an absolutely gripping memoir of all the behind the scenes activities that went on at uh, Florence. But apart from these studies, uh, she has distinguished herself as one of the world's leading authorities on the Mother of God in the life of the Orthodox Church. The list of her publications is lengthy, and here I will highlight just some of the major publications that she has produced on the Mother of God. In 2015, she published an excellent short volume called Gateway of Life, Thinking on the Mother of God. This is the seventh volume in St. Vladimir's Foundation uh, series, for those of you who are familiar with the series. 
and is probably the best introduction to the Mother of God in the Orthodox Church currently available. In 2019, she edited a volume of papers called The Reception of the Virgin in Byzantium, Marian Narratives in Texts and Images, published by Cambridge University Press. This followed an earlier edited volume, The Cult of the Mother of God in Byzantium, published by Ashgate in 2011. In 2021, she published a major monograph with Cambridge University Press called The Virgin Mary in Byzantium, Hymns, Homilies, and Hagiography, which covers the period from 400 to 1,000. So if her 2015 book that I mentioned is the best short treatment of the Mother of God, it seems to me that this new book is right now the best monograph length or book length uh, treatment of that same uh, subject. Professor Cunningham has also distinguished herself as a translator, and many of you will have read or be familiar with her book called Wider Than Heaven, Eighth Century Byzantine Homilies on the Mother of God, published in 2008. This is a collection of translations that includes homilies on the Mother of God by John of Damascus, Andrew of Crete, Yermanos of Constantinople, and other Middle Byzantine writers. Many of these homilies were not previously available in English, and they provide us with a remarkable look into Middle Byzantine liturgical devotion to the Theotokos. Most recently, she has completed a translation of the earliest life of the Mother of God. We have saints' lives. We also have lives of the Mother of God. She recently completed a, an English translation of the oldest, the earliest of these lives, written by the monk Epiphanios, not to be confused with Epiphanius of, uh, of Cyprus, in the late 8th or early 9th century, and which is scheduled to appear in uh, June of this uh, year. So to really understand and appreciate uh, Professor Cunningham's contribution to the study of Mary, it is helpful to recall that prior to her work, scholarship on the Mother of God was heavily focused on late antiquity or the early Byzantine period with special, special attention to the Third Ecumenical Council, which met in Ephesus in 431. I mean, that of course was the council where the Mother of God officially received the title of Theotokos. So it was natural for historians and others to focus on that uh, early period. But beyond interest in that early period, there was almost no interest in the Mother of God in the middle and later Byzantine periods. So I think it's fair to say that uh, Professor Cunningham's most significant contribution to the field has been the work that she has done. Books, articles, translations, I mean, it's, it's, it's an, an unbelievable body of work that she has done on the Mother of God in the middle Byzantine period. Now, why should that period be so important? Well, that's the period after iconoclasm when Orthodox devotion to the Mother of God developed in new and fascinating ways, and we owe much of our understanding about that period and those developments to the good work of my friend and colleague, Professor Mary Cunningham. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Do you need a hand? Okay, you got the microphone. Fine, thank you. I'll be down here for you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Father Maximus. And it's a great honor to be here, great privilege to be in your company. Christ is risen. So I wanted to start my talk today by asking a few questions. Who was Mary, the mother of God, for Byzantine Christians? Was she a symbol of the Christological mystery? the bridge between God and humanity, who enabled salvation through the incarnation of Christ? Was she a triumphant female and virginal defender of Christians who superseded the goddess Athena in protecting the imperial city of Constantinople from all invaders? Or was she a real historical person who gave birth to Christ, supported him in his ministry, and sought throughout her life to grow closer to God, 
even as she experienced the pain that accompanied his death on the cross before his burial and resurrection. Oh, point it this way. The answer, I think, is that Mary was all of these things and more. She was a multifaceted figure who could be imagined, praised, and invoked in a variety of contexts. If we focus on the symbolic importance of the Mother of God, she represented not only the rest of humanity in her person, but also the whole of creation. As Andrew of Crete wrote in the early 8th century, she is the great world in miniature, the world containing him who brought the world from nothingness into being, that it might be the messenger of his own greatness. I'd like in my talk today to explore with you the various ways in which Byzantine Christians understood and approached the Mother of God. Depending on their social status and level of education, these citizens of the Eastern Roman Empire would have received different sorts of teachings and experiences regarding the all-holy Panagia, Virgin Mary, the texts that survive from the period between approximately 330 and 1453 AD, some of which are still read in the Orthodox churches today, convey the importance of Mary, not only as a figure who is central to the Christological mystery, but also as someone who appeared to supplicants at times of crisis and who represented a model of monastic asceticism. The majority of texts, which survive in hundreds of manuscripts and which continue to be sung in the liturgical offices and liturgies today, are the hymns that celebrate Mary's role as birth giver of God, Theotokos, and explain, mainly by means of prophecy or typology, how she acted as a link between the divine and created worlds when she gave birth to God, the Word, in his human hypostasis. These liturgical texts also offered Christians a vehicle for praising the Mother of God and for appealing to her for her merciful intercession. Homilies, many of which continued to be read out at the great feasts of the Theotokos throughout the Byzantine centuries and beyond, would also have informed the faithful of her central importance in Christian doctrine. Whereas hymns and homilies tended to focus on Mary, the Theotokos, that is, the virginal mother who gave birth to God, other forms of literary text sometimes explored her personal characteristics. It's not always clear whether the authors of apocryphal or hagiographical narratives believed that they were uncovering the real historical Mary or whether they were constructing more symbolic or theological accounts of her sanctity as the mother of God. However, a more rounded picture of the Virgin as a human woman of exceptional holiness emerges from these various texts. What all Byzantine writers, as well as icon painters and others who celebrated the Virgin Mary shared was the desire to celebrate this holy human figure who nevertheless surpassed all others except her son in her sinless purity and devotion to God. Before we begin exploring these texts, it's worth considering briefly the sources on which they were based. As any Christian, whether Byzantine or modern, will know, the canonical books of the Old and New Testaments, which were approved by the early fathers, represent the most trusted witnesses to the lives of Jesus Christ, his mother Mary, and the rest of his followers. Unfortunately, as the fathers themselves noticed, the Gospels are relatively silent about the Virgin Mary's background, her way of life, and her departure from this terrestrial life. This may account for the second century Bishop Ignatius of Antioch's statement that Mary's virginity was hidden from the prince of this world. So was her childbearing, and so was the death of the Lord. All these three trumpet-tongued secrets were brought to pass in the deep silence of God. 
If the Gospels were reticent about Mary's life, the Old Testament was replete with references to her, although these were expressed in prophetic or typological language. Nevertheless, explicit discussion of Mary's background, her infancy, death, and assumption into heaven began to emerge in later Christian centuries, presumably as people became more interested both in her role as Theotokos and as a holy figure in her own right. The earliest text, which is probably dated to the middle of the second century, is the Protevangelium of James. This apocryphal work, which circulated widely in the Byzantine world and influenced later homilies, hymns, hagiography, and iconography, tells the story of Mary's conception from her aged and so far sterile parents, Joachim and Anna. Her entrance into the temple at the age of three, where she was fed by the hand of an angel, her betrothal to Joseph at the age of 12, and the Annunciation and Nativity of Christ that followed. About three centuries later, more, more texts began to circulate, both in Syriac and Greek, which described the dormition or death of the Mother of God and her assumption into heaven. Byzantine theologians and church leaders had reservations about the orthodoxy and reliability of such texts. Nevertheless, they filled important gaps in Mary's stories and inspired feast days, including her nativity, her entrance into the temple, and her dormition. From about the early 7th century onward, preachers and hymnographers used these apocryphal sources when they celebrated these great events in the legendary life of the Mother of God. As Averill Cameron has pointed out, these sources offered the stories that people wanted to hear. It's worth remembering that such narratives operated not only at a literal level, but they also provided theological reflection on Mary's role in the mystery of the Incarnation. I would like in my talk today to examine three main aspects of the Byzantine Virgin Mary. First, we should turn to her key role in the incarnation of Christ. This is the aspect of the Mother of God that emerged first in Christian tradition as theologians reflected on the qualities of the human woman who was chosen to contain the Son and Word of God. Second, I shall focus on the powerful figure who appeared on the walls of Constantinople during the siege of the Avars in 626 and at shrines in the same city to perform miracles of healing. She also acted as intercessor for faithful Christians who appealed to her in both private and collective prayer. Third and finally, there's what I would call the historical or legendary Mary, who spent the first 12 years of her life in the temple, being prepared and indeed preparing herself for the awe-inspiring role that she had been chosen to play. From about the fourth century onward, various writers, including three hagiographers who were active in the ninth and 10th centuries, envisaged, envisaged the Virgin as a model of Christian asceticism. She devoted herself to a life of prayer, both before and after the crucifixion and resurrection of her son. This image of Mary, which depicts her achieving what Gregory Palamas calls, quote, a silence of the mind in her encounter with God, brings us back to Ignatius of Antioch's perception of her mysterious role in the incarnation of Christ. The Virgin Mary, as the birth giver and hesychastic disciple of Christ, embodied the mystery that lies at the heart of Christian doctrine. Mary's essential role in the incarnation of Christ was recognized by the Apostle Paul, the evangelists, the apostolic fathers, and all who taught Orthodox Christian doctrine thereafter. It's not known exactly when the epithet Theotokos, or birth giver of God, began to be used, but it's possible that it dates back to as early as the beginning of the third century. Gregory of Nazianzus, along with the other two Cappadocian fathers, 
certainly used the term. He also described the paradoxical doctrine of the incarnation concisely and according to a patchwork of biblical references in his oration on the Son. Gregory writes, he was begotten, yet he was already begotten of a woman, and yet she was a virgin. That it was from a woman makes it human, that she was a virgin makes it divine. On earth he has no father, but in heaven no mother. In other words, Mary, a human virginal mother, both provided Christ with his physical nature and contained his divinity within her womb. She thus guaranteed the reality of the incarnation. This doctrine was endorsed at the Council of Ephesus in 431 and gained nuance at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, as bishops explored further the communication of properties between the human and divine natures that occurred in the central mystery of Christian doctrine. Although we thus see a clear progression in Christological thinking about the Theotokos in early Christian doctrine, a question arises. Did the fathers and bishops of the church pursue such theological reflection in a purely theoretical, and I should add in a prayerful way, or was this driven in part by growing popular, popular devotion to the Virgin Mary? It's surprising to see a sudden burst of Marian praise appearing, especially in homilies that were delivered to mixed audiences in cathedrals and sometimes at newly discovered Marian shrines in or around Jerusalem in the early fifth century. That is during the decades that preceded the Council of Ephesus. The Patriarch of Constantinople, Atticus, and a presbyter of Jerusalem named Hezekius composed homilies in praise of the Virgin that employed new metaphors and types in order to describe her role in the incarnation. This trend was taken much further by the Constantinopolitan bishop and later patriarch Proclus, who described Mary, quote, as the workshop for the union of natures, the marketplace of the contract of salvation, and the bridal chamber in which the word took the flesh in marriage. In a homily that was delivered in the presence of the dissenting patriarch Nestorius in the great church, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. And I was using Father Maximus's wonderful translation and commentary of that homily here. We know that many of these pre-Ephesine homilies were delivered in connection with a single Marian feast that existed at this time which was celebrated on one of the days before or after the Feast of the Nativity of Christ on the 25th of December. Hezekias of Jerusalem's homilies are known to have been delivered at various churches around or near Jerusalem, including at the newly discovered site of the Cathisma, where Mary was believed to have rested on her way to Bethlehem before giving birth to Jesus. It's difficult not to imagine that such celebrations, which often involved stational liturgies, that is processions, and all night vigils, inspired devotion to the Virgin Mary on the part of all who participated in them. A close symbiosis between theological reflection and popular devotion, often enhanced by the discovery of physical sites or relics, thus began to appear in the course of the fifth century, both in the Holy Land and in Constantinople. This grew stronger during the centuries that followed, often with stimulus from Jerusalem, promoting corresponding cultic and festal activity in the imperial city. Devotion to the Virgin Mary took a new turn in the sixth century as liturgical writers, including Romanos the Melodist, began to focus on her human qualities, especially as the tender and later grieving mother of Christ. Romanos portrays Mary's wonder and love for her newborn son in his first contachion on the Nativity. She describes herself there as a humble servant in whom the High King came to dwell. 
The virgin's doubts, grief, and anger at the sight of her son being dragged to the cross reveal her human qualities even more vividly in Romanos's contaction on her lament. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> These themes would be taken further following the triumph of orthodoxy in 843 as iconophile preachers and hymnographers emphasized the reality of Christ's humanity by focusing on the tender love and sufferings of his mother as she witnessed him dying on the cross. The development of an affective form of Marian devotion during these centuries reflected not only a particular didactic purpose, but also a burgeoning devotion to the Mother of God during a period of exceptional military and political upheaval. As I've already suggested, Byzantine congregations, not only in the imperial city, but throughout the empire, would thus have received most of their teaching about Mary, the Mother of God, through hymns and homilies, that were sung and preached in cathedrals, parish churches, and monasteries. These works, which are transmitted in hundreds of liturgical books and collections, provide a remarkable fusion of pr prophetic, typological, narrative, and intercessory material. In the case of hymnography, ah, oh, that's not what I, yeah. In the case of hymnography, this can be so condensed that it's reasonable to ask how Christians were able to understand its symbolic meaning. Mary is described as Jacob's ladder, the burning bush, Gideon's fleece, the overshadowed or curdled mountain, the tabernacle, the temple, and all of the furniture therein. Many hymns end with supplication to the mother of God, since she is the compassionate protector and intercessor for all faithful Christians. Some hymns, such as the Stavro Theotokia, which began to be composed from about the middle of the ninth century onward, describe Mary's suffering at the foot of the cross, thus serving not only to remind congregations of her and her son's human nature, but also providing models for compunction and repentance at the sight of God's sacrifice on behalf of the rest of humanity. Turning now to my second topic, the Virgin Mary as defender and intercessor for Constantinopolitan Christians. It's clear already that this overlaps somewhat with the first. I would like to focus, however, on the distinctive aspect that Mary assumed when she was seen or sometimes imagined protecting the imperial city from invaders, including Avars, Persians, Slavs, Muslims, and others. Famously, due to three almost contemporary accounts of the siege of 626, the Virgin was believed to have miraculously vanquished the enemies. As the deacon and singelos of the great church Theodore put it, quote, the Virgin was present everywhere throughout the siege, she overcame without being overcome. She spread fear and horror among the enemy while giving strength to her servants. She preserved her subjects safe and sound and devastated the enemy masses." Unquote. According to another source, the Chronicon Pascale or Paschal Chronicle, the Avar leader or Khan actually saw the Virgin rushing about on the walls of Constantinople during one of the battles. Later during the same siege, Mary positioned herself near her main shrine, the church of the Vlacherne, and caused the wooden boats, the monoxyli of the Avars to sink, thus clinching the victory of the Byzantines. It's not known whether the second prologue of the Akathistos hymn, sometimes called the Ti Ipermacho on the basis of its opening line, was written to commemorate this siege or a later one, this time by Arabs in 717 to 18. However, this stanza expresses vividly the Virgin's role as leader in battle and defender of the imperial city. 
Bissara Pencheva, Vasily Ki Limberis, and other scholars have suggested that Mary's virginity was a vital element in the construction of her role as patron and defender of Constantinople. In this respect, she continued an ancient tradition of virgin warriors, such as Athena, the Vestal priestesses in Rome, and the Amazons. Nevertheless, Mary's virginal motherhood represents a unique aspect of her power as defender of the imperial city in the Christian context. She could call on the power of Christ, her son, in the same way that Moses relied on God when he led the Jews out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. Also in Constantinople, between approximately the late 5th and 10th centuries, a collection of miracle stories associated with the Virgin Mary's Shrine of the Spring, which came to be known as the Thoodokos Pii, or Life Receiving Spring, was collected and written down, and Father Maximus was talking about this in his introduction earlier. This compilation survives in one 12th century manuscript and has recently been edited and translated by Alice Mary Talbot. According to the accounts of the Constantinopolitan citizens, who range in status from emperors and their consorts to ordinary working people, the Virgin Mary appeared in visions to her supplicants and worked healing miracles on their behalf. Mary could appear in various guises, and according to these narrators, which is rather puzzling, really. She is described as a respectable woman or as some woman of modest means by Evdokia, the sister-in-law of the Emperor Morris, but elsewhere by one of the monks in the monastery that was associated with the shrine as, quote, a woman robed in purple, towering as high as the lintel of the church doorway in the majesty of her stature, unquote. The latter description corresponds with those found in miracle stories collected by the late 6th or early 7th century Palestinian monk John Moscus. Moscus recounts that Abba Kyriakos, who resided at Alavra near the Jordan River, had a dream in which he saw a woman of stately appearance clad in purple. She refused to enter his cell because he had borrowed a book containing two works by the her heretic Nestorius, which he promptly returned to its owner, telling him to cut out the offending pages and burn them. The mother of God is a powerful presence, according to, most of these, to all of these stories, although she can occasionally appear unobtrusively, as we just saw. The compiler of the miracles of the P.E. or source stresses that her miraculous virginity, both before and after the birth of Christ, explains her power and renders it ineffable. The Virgin Mary works miracles by her own volition and holy status. However, she also inhabits the mystery that surrounded the incarnation of her divine son. I would like to turn now to the third and final part of my talk today, which concerns the development of an ascetic or even hesychastic mother of God during the Byzantine period. Focus on Mary's virginity, both during and after the birth of Christ, had, as we've already seen, emerged very early in Christian thought. The evangelists, Matthew and Luke, both state explicitly, following the Septuagint translation of Isaiah 7.14, that Mary was a virgin, Parthenos, when she received the message of the archangel Gabriel and conceived Christ. If they are more reticent about her status after the birth, later texts, sometimes classed as apocryphal, soon filled this gap. The Protevangelion of James, which was probably composed, as I said, in the middle of the second century, describes how a midwife named Salome performed a physical examination of the Virgin Mary after she had given birth in order to verify the intact state of her womb. Another text that is known as the Ascension of Isaiah and was probably compiled between the second and fourth centuries 
provides an even more miraculous account of Christ's birth. It says that Mary and Joseph were sitting alone in their house when, on looking up, she suddenly saw a small infant, and she was astounded. And after her astonishment had worn off, her womb was found as it was at first, before she had conceived. Focus on Mary's virginity in contexts such as these perhaps has more to do with the proving the miraculous nature of the incarnation and the divinity of Christ than it does with describing the personal qualities of his mother. However, her purity and holiness represent an important aspect of this teaching. One of the first texts that deals explicitly with Mary's own preparation for her role as virginal mother of Christ appears in the fourth century in the context of an emerging monastic movement that involved women as, as well as men. This is the Bishop Athanasius's first letter to a community of virgins in Alexandria in which he presents Mary as a model for them to follow. It's odd, perhaps, that Athanasius pictures Mary growing up in her parents' home rather than in the Jewish temple. However, he describes her as a pious young virgin who lived a retired and prayerful life while also serving her local community. He writes, For she desired good works, doing what is proper, having true thoughts in faith and purity. And she did not desire to be seen by people. Rather, she prayed that God would be her judge. Nor did she have an eagerness to leave her house, nor was she at all acquainted with the streets. Rather, she remained in her house being calm, imitating the fly in honey. She virtuously spent the excess of her manual labor on the poor, and she would pray to God privately, taking care about these two things, that she not let evil thoughts dwell in her heart, and also that she not acquire curiosity or learn hardness of heart. Her words were calm, her voice moderate. She did not cry out. And being glad in her heart, she did not slander anyone, nor did she willingly listen to slander. This seems like a very believable young, pious girl. The passage continues with descriptions of Mary's diet, it was modest and she loved to fast. Her visits to the temple and dutiful respect for her pious parents, Joachim and Anna. In short, Athanasius paints a picture of a model female virgin who lives at home but dedicates her life to God. This image of the virgin as a human being who was endowed with the virtues that were considered appropriate for a young female virgin was superseded by the kind of panegyrical and hagiographical praise that I described in the first two sections of this talk, especially from the early fifth century onward. However, it does surface again in a few festal homilies, such as a homily on the nativity of the mother of God that is attributed in most manuscripts to the eighth century preacher and theologian, John of Damascus. Towards the end of this, oration, the author addresses Mary as follows. Hail Mary, sweetest little daughter of Anna. How shall I portray your most pious bearing, your robe, your gracious countenance? You possessed mature judgment in a youthful body. Your modest dress escaped all softness and delicacy. Your gait was pious and undisturbed, free from foolish ostentation. Your manner was austere, but mixed with gaiety. You were unapproachable by men. A witness to this is the fear that came over you at the unaccustomed address of the angel. You were docile and obedient towards your parents, while your humble mind was engaged in the highest contemplation. Your cheerful speech came forth from a soul that was free of anger. This description of Mary as a young girl is similar to that of Athanasius. She is portrayed as quiet, intelligent, modest, and above all, contemplative. Like his fourth century predecessor, the author pictures her growing up in her own home, perhaps because he treats the apocryphal Protoevangelion of James with a certain degree of skepticism. 
The next important development in the literary construction of a fully human and ascetic Virgin Mary was the composition of what I believe to be the first full-length Greek life in her honor by an early 9th century monk who's known as Apiphanius of the Kalistratu Monastery in Constantinople. I've produced a translation and commentary of this life, which will be published soon by Liverpool University Press. As I argue in my introduction to that volume, as well as in a couple of recent articles, Epiphanius was concerned above all to portray the ascetic and prayerful activities of the mother of God, probably for the benefit of his celibate male community. He describes her formation in the Jewish temple where, and here Epiphanius seems to echo the accounts of Athanasius and John of Damascus, she, quote, was serious with respect to everything and spoke little. She was quick to obey, well-spoken, reserved in speech towards every person, solemn, calm, without anger, full of reverence, respectful, paying every person respect and veneration, so that they all marveled at her intelligence and speech. The only difference you notice here from Athanasius and John of Damascus is that Epiphanius places her firmly in the temple for her growing up. According to Epiphanius, Mary devoted her time to fasting, vigils, and prayer, not only in the Jewish temple, but at Joseph's house once she had been betrothed to him and had left the temple, and above all, in the house on Zion in Jerusalem, where she lived with the evangelist John after the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of her son, Jesus Christ. It's in the last of these settings that Mary made indentations on the marble floor, according to Epiphanius, due to her constant kneeling in prayer. And she also worked miracles among the poor and sick who approached her. Epiphanius seems to add elements that reflect his own invention in this life. So to some extent he follows earlier writers, but he adds elements such as her continuing devotion to asceticism throughout her terrestrial life. The theme would be taken much further in two late 10th century lives of the Virgin which were probably influenced by Epiphanius, but which surpassed his life in their weaving together of praise, narrative, and theological reflection in honor of the Mother of God. The first of these texts, which has recently been edited and translated by Father Maximus Constas and Christos Similidis, is The Life of the Virgin by John Geometries. The second, which survives only in Georgian, has been shown by Professor Similides to be a loose translation, or more accurately, perhaps, an adaptation of Geometry's life by the late 10th century abbot and translator Euthemius the Athenite. There's not time today, today to describe in detail the scholarly controversy that surrounds the latter text. Suffice it to say that whereas its editors Michel Van Asbroek and Stephen Shoemaker both argued that the Greek original of the Georgian text was written in the early 7th century, and according to Van Asbroek by the great theologian Maximus the Confessor himself, Father Maximus and Professor Similidis have proved beyond doubt, at least in my view, that the text is dependent on that of Euthemius's contemporary John Geometries. The sophisticated combination of many of the themes and effective ref reflection on the Mother of God that I've been describing in my talk today, many of which developed slowly in the course of the middle Byzantine centuries, testify to the late 10th century date for both works. The lives by John Geometries and Euthemius the Athenite both build on Epiphanius the monk's depiction of Mary's ascetic and contemplative training as a child within the precincts of the Jewish temple. Geometries writes, for example, for her all but heavenly flesh was nourished by heavenly nourishment 
received from the hand of an angel or indeed an archangel, while her sacred soul was formed and initiated into higher mysteries by the same angel, or rather by the Trinity itself, both the other mysteries and all those related to the Trinity, and thus the growth of her body and soul advanced in parallel, just as that of her son later did, in stature and grace, the former from such solid food, the latter from being trained and formed by such teachings. It was absolutely necessary that she, essentially, should become not only a receptacle of the whole divine nature, but also a blending through herself of that nature and the whole of human nature. That's quite a remarkable passage, that. The panegyrist goes on to describe the young virgin's thirst for knowledge, kindness, modesty, and many other virtues. She keeps night nightly vigils, fasts, prays constantly, and thus sets an example for others. These passages are replicated in the Georgian or Euthymian virgin, version of the life. Both texts com combine description of Mary's conduct and demeanor with biblical allusions that include Psalm 44, Proverbs, and the Song of Songs. The two lives also follow Epiphanius in recounting the virgin's continuing asceticism in the home of Joseph, once she's been betrothed to him and left the temple, and later at that of John the Evangelist in Jerusalem. One extra twist, which the two 10th century hagiographers developed more fully than did their early 9th century model, is the Virgin Mary's guidance to other girls and women who decide to adopt the ascetic way of life. This begins with Joseph's daughters and is followed by such figures as Mary Magdalene and the disciple Peter's mother-in-law and wife. In fact, thanks to her standing within the earliest community of Christ's followers, Mary eventually became, quote, the guide for men and women after Christ's ascension into heaven, unquote. She led the way in fasting and prayer and even directed and instructed the apostles on their missions. In short, according to John Geometries, quote, she was as is fitting for a queen she, as was fitting for a queen, dwelled at the center of the whole world, that is Jerusalem, and indeed in its most important place, Zion, together with the disciple and fellow virgin, her adopted son, John, such that their house was like a general's tent or the seat of a kingdom." Unquote. I would like to return at this point, however, and by way of a conclusion, to the deeper mystery that each of these authors wants his audience to see in the context of the Virgin Mary's life of asceticism and prayer. John Geometri states towards the end of his account, when the Virgin is living in Jerusalem and instructing her female disciples, the myrrh-bearing women and the apostles, that she appeared as, quote, someone who transcended every angelic and noetic initiation." Unquote. He adds that if the evangelists and theologians, by whom he must mean the early fathers, remain silent about these things concerning her, this too was a sign of their wisdom, as well as of the economy of the spirit. Thus, silence, once again, is seen both as a characteristic of the Mother of God and as the appropriate way to approach her. It's this insight which Gregory Palamas develops to an extraordinary degree in his second homily on the entrance of the Virgin into the temple. Influenced perhaps by the accounts of the 9th and 10th century hagiographers who saw this period of Mary's life as spiritually formative, Palamas meditates in his homily on the implications of this premise. At the climax of his homily, after describing the behavior and spiritual nourishment that the Virgin received in the temple, the 14th century monk and theologian states that, quote, the Virgin found that holy stillness was her guide, stillness in which the mind and the world stand still. 
forgetfulness of the things below, initiation into the things above, the laying aside of ideas for something better." Unquote. He goes on to say in even more high-flown language that, having loosed every bond with material things, shaken off every tie and even risen above sympathy towards her own body, she united her mind with its turning towards itself and attention and with unceasing holy prayer. Having become her own mistress by this means and being established above the jumble of thoughts in all their different guises and above absolutely every form of being, she constructed a new and indescribable way to heaven, which I would call silence of the mind. Intent upon this silence, she flew high above created things, saw God's glory more clearly than Moses, and beheld divine grace, which is not at all within the capacity of men's senses, but is a gracious and holy sight for spotless souls and minds. Later in the same text, Palamas seals his assertion that Mary represented the first and perhaps only example of a deified human being with the words, quote, she alone of all mankind throughout the ages was initiated into the highest mysteries by these divine visions, was united in this way with God and became like him. Such a view of the mother of God which must have played a part in her adoption as the patron of the monks on Mount Athos, brings us back full circle to the mysterious but essential role that she fulfilled in the incarnation of Christ. As hymnographers, preachers, theologians, and hagiographers all told their Byzantine audiences or readers, this role was ineffable since it had occurred, as the second century Bishop Ignatius of Antioch put it, in the, quote, in the deep silence of God. Nevertheless, a paradox exists here. The Virgin Mary could also, as Andrew of Crete suggested in the early eighth century, be perceived everywhere in scripture and by extension in the created world. He wrote, for there is not, indeed there is not any place in the whole of God's inspired scripture where on going about one would not see signs of Mary the Theotokos scattered about in diverse ways. See how she is adorned with names of many meanings and revealed very clearly in many places as shrub, rock, land, garden, country, field, spring, ewe lamb, drop, and as many other types as the renowned interpreters of the spirit prophetically called her in accordance with the mystical insight that reveals itself in symbols. As I suggested at the beginning of my talk, Mary was a multifaceted figure in the Byzantine Christian tradition. She symbolized the incarnation, that is the grace-filled creation and human nature that received and nurtured Christ, the word of God, but was also understood to be a human woman who, although blessed with divine grace from the moment of her conception, grew in favor and stature before God. Theologians who preached, sang, or narrated the story of this holy figure sought to maintain a balance between silence and exuberant verbal expression. In this way, they reflected in their teaching the paradoxical nature of the incarnation itself. Thank you. Thank you.